it can be really hard to wrap our minds around race in the Bible, especially race in the New Testament. And the New Testament thinking at the time in the first century, there were really kind of three groups of people in the world. They were the Jewish people, the chosen people of God. They were the Samaritans, which I'll get to in a second. And then they were the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are people who were not Jewish. So in a sense, you could think that there are Jews and Gentiles, but the Samaritans are this in-between group. And it's the in-between group that gets hated the worst. If you remember when Jesus was asked, who is my neighbor? And he told the story of the good Samaritan. You know, it's one thing to say, well, it's us and them, but sometimes the people who are who are the most similar to you, but just a little bit off in your thinking, are the ones that you have the hardest time to love. The people who you might see as your, your enemy because you feel almost in religious or political or social competition, economic competition with them. So Samaria was in northern Israel, and what happened in the exile at the end of the Old Testament, when the Assyrians came and the Babylonians came and they conquered the land, they you know, took down Jerusalem, and they would take the leading class of people, the wealthy class, the leaders, and they would exile them. They would take them off someplace else. The exile was not all of Israel. It was just a select group of people. That would leave the common everyday people in the land and of Israel, and the Babylonians or the Assyrians, they would, they would take the leaders off to some other place. They would just scatter them. This became known as the diaspora, which is a Greek word for scattering, the scattered people of God. So like when Paul goes on his missionary journeys and he finds synagogues in all these cities, that very well could be the ripple effect of this scattering that happened 500, 600, 700 years prior with the Babylonians and the Assyrians. So in the meantime, there are the people, the Israelites, the Jewish people who are left in Israel, and the Assyrians and the Babylonians in the meantime take people from other nations and put them also in Israel. And so now you have this mixing of people, this this blending of people, intermarrying of people, of Jews and Gentiles, and that the, the offspring of this group is basically racially um, and interracial marriages becomes the Samaritans. Because there was not just a, a racial uh, component, but also a religious component, because the Samaritans then begin kind of their own religion based on the first five books of the Old Testament. This is why they're worshiping in Gerizim. You see that in John 4 when Jesus encounters the woman at the well. And she talks about the worship question. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you talk to me like this? And then she sees he's a religious man. And so she begins to maybe uncomfortably engage Jesus in religious dialogue because they're having this this uh, cross-cultural and, and gender conversation out on, by themselves, which is very much taboo in the first century. And uh, so there's the Jewish people, the chosen people of God. There's the Gentiles who are non-Jews, the nations which would be Greeks and Romans and people like that. And then there are the Samar- Samaritans, who are the descendants of who the Jewish people, from their holy, you know, people of God perspective, would say these are the children of those who compromise themselves. And they intermarried into the nations, into other races and, and uh, religious ideologies and pagan ideologies, and they, they've uh, corrupted the scripture, scriptures and, the, and religion, religions, and they've created a temple and altar in another place other than Jerusalem, and so there's this competition and enmity and hatred between Jew, Jewish people and Samaritans, and there's also enmity between Jewish people and the Gentiles, the non-Jews, because the, the, the Gentiles are really seen as pagan idolaters. They do not serve the one God of Israel. They've not chosen to do that. There are proselytes who are Gentiles who become Jews, who the males have to be circumcised. They got to be kosher. They got to follow the holy days and the Sabbaths and all these kinds of things. So there is kind of that group, but they would be considered Jewish, but not, not ethnically Jewish, but religiously Jewish. So the Jews have a hard time with the Gentiles because the Gentiles are un, uh, unclean, not because necessarily of their racial differences, but because of their religious practices. They're worshiping idols. They're offering sacrifices to idols. They're eating meat that's been offered to idols. So there's a real taboo about Jewish people fellowshipping or associating with Gentile people because they would be seen as unclean. And as Richard Beck points out, if you've not read the book Unclean by Richard Beck, it's a really good read, very short book. Uh, very to the point. You should read it. I'll put a link in the description to that. There's a, there's an idea in Leviticus, the Old Testament, that, that unclean begets unclean, that if something is unclean, touches something that is clean, the clean becomes unclean, not the other way around. Jesus actually flip-flopped that script, didn't he? Because if there's a leper and you are clean and you touch a leper, the leper takes his uncleanliness, not not actively like he's doing it or she's doing it, but the idea religiously and in a holiness code wise is is that uncleanness always comes upon the clean and cleanness is not passed on to make unclean things clean. Jesus touched lepers and made them clean. 
you know, Jesus actually flipped that script because he was the Holy Son of God who had all the divine power and ability to do anything he wanted. So, so there are, you have to understand, first of all, um, you have to understand, first of all, just the, the basic definitions. There's the Jewish people who are descendants of Abraham. They are a racial uh, and religious group. There are Gentiles in that number, just as it talks about in the Old Testament, the alien stranger who lives among you. Some of them proselytize themselves and become Jewish. So those people would be ethnically other cultures, you know, other races, uh, not Jewish, but Jewish religiously. There are the Samaritans who are the descendants of um, interracial marriage and interreligious marriage between Jewish people and Gentile people from five to 700 years prior. 587, 722, the uh, Babylonian and Samaritan conquering of the land. So Samaria kind of becomes a region in kind of north central Israel where the, the people of the Samaritans live. And Jesus finds himself going through Samaria rather than some, some Jewish people, and there's debate about this, but some Jewish people would apparently go around Samaria to avoid becoming unclean by being associated with these people who they had so much hatred for. Jesus, it says in John 4, found his way going through Samaria. He decided to go right through the middle of it, and he encounters this woman at the well. And when he has this discussion at, of the woman at the well, and he prophesies some things about her that he wouldn't have known otherwise than he had divine knowledge and was the Messiah. And she begins into a messianic conversation and a conversation about, about religiosity, religion, places of worship. You know, you worship in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans worship on this mountain. She's talking about Gerizim. Why Gerizim? Because they believed in Genesis to Deuteronomy as being the Bible and no other books, the Pentateuch, no other books were part of the inspired scriptures from their point of view. So if you go through Genesis to Deuteronomy and you look for authorized places of worship, places where God showed up, uh, not just places where God showed up, God, places where God showed up in Samaria, the place that you wind up with is Gerizim. There's a, an encounter with God, a theophany and a God uh, encounter, God making himself manifest, visible, you know, revealing himself to the people, to Moses and others in, at Gerizim. So that was kind of their approved by uh, example place of worship that was located in Samaria. The Jewish people didn't like that because God in the Old Testament later, and what the Samaritans wouldn't consider real books of the Bible, said that it should be in Jerusalem at the temple. So now the, the, that furthers the enmity between the Jewish people and the Gentiles because, you know, you're not worshiping properly. You're not worshiping in the proper place. You have to kind of come to us to do this properly and probably even proselytize yourself to true the true religion, to Judaism, to really be right with God. And so there's a racial ethnic component and there's also a religious component and a, which then brings about holiness and clean and unclean and who you can and can't associate with because a good Jewish person doesn't want to associate with people who may make them unclean. You would do that through the, the Gentiles or the Samaritans through these religious practices that they believe were unacceptable, especially pagan idolatry in, uh, in the Gentiles. So when um, the, the church starts in Acts 2, it's all in-house, it's all Jewish people. When Peter gives the sermon, he's Jewish, the apostles are Jewish, Jesus was Jewish, and he's preaching to Jewish people who have come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost in Acts 2, which is roughly 50 days after the Passover when Jesus had been crucified and then raised three days later. He's now seven weeks later, 49, 50 days, and he's preaching this sermon at Pentecost. And you notice that before Peter begins to preach, Jesus again in Acts 1.8, he gives this list of how they will be witnesses and they will begin in Jerusalem in Acts 1.8 and then into to Judea, so in the city in which they're in in Acts 1, to the region that they're in, Judea, and then into Samaria, he says, they will go, and then to the ends of the earth. And that's Jesus' shorthand way of saying the ends of the earth are really the Gentiles. And I, I do wonder if in the Great Commission when Jesus says, go into all nations or make disciples of all the nations, and then when he says to the ends of the earth, I do wonder if the apostles thought that Jesus still meant the scattered diaspora uh, ch children, descendants of those who had been exiled and were, were living in the land. This is where synagogues came from, by the way, where the exiled people who were trying to find a way to worship without being close to Jerusalem. So when Paul goes on his missionary journeys and he goes to these different cities and he finds these synagogues and places, these are the descendants of people who had been exiled hundreds of years prior. They found themselves in Turkey and Greece and Italy and all these different places and they have, they have settled in and they've formed synagogues as these religious communities to hold on to their identity even though they're not back in Jerusalem near the temple around their people. 
so when the book of Acts uh, kicks off and Jesus says, you'll be witnesses to the ends of the earth, I, I really think that's what the disciples are, are thinking, but, but they did not yet understand all that this would mean, that they truly were to convert Samaritans and that they truly were to convert uh, the Gentiles. In, in Jesus' ministry, on at least two occasions, he says that he was not sent to the Gentiles, he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. So you could understand how that might be a little bit hard for them to wrap their minds around, especially when you think of Jesus as Old Testament Messiah, the one who is to restore and redeem Israel, the one who is to rule on David's throne forever, Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, that it's, it just has a very Jewish feel. And it would be very hard for them to understand uh, how this Jewish messianic mission would affect the Gentiles. Now, Isaiah says you're to be a light to the nations, and maybe they should have connected these dots. But it doesn't really sound like they have. I think it's Acts 1-6 where Jesus is asked, is now the time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And then Jesus responds with, "You are going to the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So when the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2 and the apostles are filled with the Spirit and Peter begins preaching this message in tongues and the tongues of the people who are present in their own native languages, they're hearing this gospel, even though Peter's never been trained in these languages and the other apostles have never been trained in these languages. The people at Pentecost, this scattered Jewish people who have followed the Torah, the law that says, come to Jerusalem for these festivals, and they've come to celebrate just as they were supposed to do. They're being good Jewish people at Pentecost, which is also the Feast of Booths, which is the giving of the law, the giving of the law at Sinai. If you remember at Sinai, there were tongues of fire and rumblings and things. Well, the Holy Spirit coming as tongues of fire upon the apostles is symbolic of a new law, a new covenant, a new established way of God relating with his people. So Peter preaches the crucified and risen Messiah, that he is the Son of God. He quotes the Psalms. How would David say that the Lord said to my Lord? How can he be talking? How can David, who's king, be talking about a descendant of his and call him his Lord? That makes no sense because the older, elder genealogical king would not call a great, 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 great grandson his own Lord. So it's, you know, Peter is, is connecting these dots, and I can't help but think that this comes out of uh, when Jesus revealed himself to the apostles, and like in Luke 24, where it says that he um, opened up the writings and the, um, the law and the prophets to them. Those are the three sections of the Old Testament. That's not just random language. Uh, there's in the Old Testament, in the Jewish Old Testament, the way they divided it was the writings, or the law, the writings, and the prophets. And that's what, exactly in Luke 24, what it says that Jesus explained all the scriptures concerning himself. So I think when Peter uh, is quoting these Old Testament passages, I think he's telling them the things that Jesus has revealed to him. So my point is this, in Acts 2, it's all still in-house, and the Jewish people come to Messiah Jesus. They are cut to the heart. They ask what they should do, 237, 238. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, uh, you know, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you know, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and 239, this promise is for you and your children and all who are far off. I still don't think Peter quite understood what he meant by that, that he was speaking words that he did not yet understand the full implications of, that all who are far off are not just scattered Jewish people, but it's the Gentiles too, and it's the Samaritans too. Jesus came for all, for God so loved the world, John three sixteen, that he gave his one and only son. So it's, it's still in-house until Acts 7, and in Acts 7, the gospel goes into Samaria, and you notice that there are miraculous things that the apostles do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm, I'm going to tie that into Acts, Acts 10. So the gospel is beginning to cross cultural, uh, religious, and racial lines. And, uh, and, and the reason I think that's important is because without the Holy Spirit leading the way, to, without, which is God himself, without God himself showing the apostles his approval of people who they disapproved of, I don't think the apostles would have initiated cross-culture, cross-racial mission. But the Holy Spirit leads the way, and they follow the leading of God and what God reveals and shows them. This is made especially evident in Acts 10. Please read that whole chapter after you watch this video or pause this right now, read it, and come back. So Peter is in Joppa. He's at Simon the Tanner's house. He's sitting on the roof. He falls asleep, and he has a dream. And in the dream, the sheet comes down from heaven, and there's all these different animals on it. And here's this voice that says, Peter, get up, kill, and eat. And Peter says, I've never, uh, you know, eaten anything unclean. It's a mixture of animals, clean and unclean, maybe some pigs and things like that, and uh, clean animals, unclean animals, all sorts of things. 
it's diverse, diverse groupings of, of animals. He has the vision three times. In the meantime, God is revealing himself to this Gentile named Cornelius, who was a God-fearer, which is a, a basically a way of saying a Gentile who's not yet proselytized himself, but has a real interest in the God of Judaism, and monotheistic, one God, not polytheistic, many gods. He's kind of turning a corner, and he's helping the Jewish community. He's giving to the Jewish community. He's, a, in a sense, a, a believer, but maybe he's not yet fully proselytized himself to become Jewish. So God shows up to him and tells him to go find Peter. Peter's at the same time having this dream. And Peter finally says, Lord, in this to this dream, this response to the dream, he says, you know, I can't eat anything unclean. And God says, don't call anything unclean that I have made clean. And right about that time, Cornelius' men who were Gentiles come and knock on the door. Peter opens the door and he talks to them and they say, you know, Cornelius, this Gentile guy has sent for you and you need to come with us. And Peter says, basically, I would, I would never do this. This is against our, our rules, except that God had showed me this, that whatever he calls unclean, whatever God makes clean, don't call it unclean. God is beginning to open his eyes. God takes the dream initiative through the speaking of Jesus to Peter. And then when Peter gets to Cornelius' house and begins to talk with them and share the gospel message with them, he, he says, he lays out the rules there about Act, uh, Acts ten thirty four maybe or so, where he says, you know, us Jews are not supposed to even associate with you Gentiles. Why? Because Gentiles are associated with uncleanness due to their practices of pagan idolatry. I mean, pagan idolatry's practices could even be things like laying under an altar, slaughtering a bull, and allowing the blood of the bull to just pour over your body in this ritual um, cult practice to be like ritually cleansed by the blood of this bull. I mean, it was some nasty stuff and just nasty practices that they would engage in. So, Peter knows that the rules say you don't go in the home of a Gentile because if you do, they're unclean and you'll become unclean. And you know God doesn't want you to be unclean. But the vision just said, whatever I call clean, you don't say is unclean. So Peter begins preaching the Jesus message to him that by the power of the Spirit, Jesus went about doing these good things and preaching this message and he shares the gospel, the good news with them. And as Peter does that, the Holy Spirit comes upon these Gentiles and gives them the same giftings, the same miraculous giftings that the Holy Spirit had given the apostles. And when Peter sees that, the, the divine initiative by the working, the presence, and the power of the Holy Spirit, that God himself is putting his stamp of approval on these people right in front of Peter's eyes. There's no denying it. And Peter says, what can keep us from baptizing them? They are just like we are. They receive the same gifts we have. This is the gospel crossing cultural and racial lines. And it is the Holy Spirit who leads the way. It is the Holy Spirit who says, not only is this okay, this is what God desires. This is good. They are just like us. Do not call anyone unclean that God has called clean. You need to cross these lines and you need to bring them into the family. You need to recognize that they are no different than you are. This was revolutionary to the Jewish people. And you can only imagine, knowing what the in-house rules were, that Peter had some splaining to do, Lucy. And Peter goes back, and, and he spends like a whole chapter or two explaining these things. And then Paul and Barnabas in 13 are sent off on their missionary journey, and it says that it was the Holy Spirit who, when they were fasting and praying, selected Paul and Barnabas as the ones to go on the first, this first missionary journey. And when they go, they encounter Jews and Gentiles alike and begin converting them. They have some explaining to do. So this all leads up to Acts, Acts chapter 15, the council at Jerusalem. And the early church, these Jewish believers and even some, some Pharisee converts, have this question, how are Gentiles, these other ethnically diverse people and religiously diverse people, Gentiles, as I've already defined, how do they come into the family of God? Shouldn't they become Jews? Because doesn't the Bible say? What's the Bible in Acts 15? It's the Old Testament. We don't have Galatians yet. We don't have Ephesians yet. Paul's not gone to any of these places yet. All you have is the Old Testament. And the Old Testament says that circumcision is a lasting ordinance, that if you don't do this cutting, you will be cut off from your people, right? And if you're not kosher, you'll be cut off from the people. If you don't obey the Sabbath, you'll be cut off from your people. You'll be even stoned or killed or whatever. The, these are the... the um, defining marks of what it means to be a Jew, the identifying uh, identity markers of Judaism. To be in the family of God, these are the things you must observe. Judaism was not a works righteousness-based system. Look up 
look up covenantal nomism, N-O-M-I-S-M in Wikipedia, and read about that. Read about N.T. Wright's take on that, James Dunn's work on that, Scott McKnight's work on that. It's really fascinating. It will change your view on Judaism. Look up E.P. Sanders, Paul and Palestinian Judaism. It's a large book. I've read it. It's uh, it's eye-opening that that we really have a had a more Lutheran view, that Luther influenced our view uh, of Judaism based on his fighting with the Catholic Church, and he really found the Catholic Church in the Old Testament. And then, you know, it wasn't until after the Second World War that Old Testament scholars and people in general said, let's get to know, really get to know Judaism. And how do you get to know Judaism? Read what they said about it. Like, read what first century Jews said about Judaism, and guess what you don't find? A system of works righteousness that we're working our way to be saved. There's a real misconception about that, and I, and I encourage you to look that up. So in this council, James and the apostles and these Pharisee believers, these Pharisee converts, uh, Christians, they uh, come up with several rules, and they and James says it seemed right to us and to the Holy Spirit that these would be the rules. Don't eat meat uh, that are of strangled animals, don't meat that has blood in it, avoid sexual immorality, etc. Those rules really come from Leviticus. And if you go back to Leviticus, look up those specific rules. And what you're going to find there in Leviticus is that in each of those instances, God said that these rules apply. Those specific rules that they picked were not random. These specific rules apply not only to the Jewish people, but also to the alien and stranger who is living among you. That's Old Testament code word for Gentile. So this was what they already knew. These were the rules that Gentiles living amongst Jewish people as proselytes or god fears. if you're going to really be among us, you can't be sexually immoral, and you can't eat the blood of strangled uh, uh, blood of, uh, meat with blood in it or strangled animals. Why not meat with blood and strangled animals? Because that's pagan idolatry. And if they're still engaging in pagan idolatry, they're not clean, and then we can't associate with them. So if they will follow these rules then we will no longer have to see them as unclean people because they're not engaging in just traditional Gentile worship cult practices. So that's why these rules come up, because they're, they're literally they're looking to their Old Testament saying, what did the Old Testament say about Gentiles living among us? Let's take those same rules and apply them. Now, they're not four random rules, which is fascinating, I think. But the point is, is that God wants Jews and Gentiles to be one in the same family, just like Paul says in Galatians. He says that there is neither slave nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Greek, but that we are all one in the same in Christ Jesus. Now, it's tempting for us to say, oh, slave or free, that's racial. Now, in a sense, I think for the Jewish people, there was somewhat of a racial component because Jews were not supposed to have other Jewish people as, as slaves, but they could have Gentile slaves according to the Old Testament rules. The Gentile slavery was not race-based. Um, it was through conquest. It was through, uh, you could sell yourself into slavery to pay a debt and then work as a slave to save money, to pay yourself back out, which is called manumission, getting back out. So it was not a race-based, the Roman system was not a, a race-based system. They were hi often highly skilled people, uh, and you might even make yourself a slave to someone to gain status of a famous person as their slave, show them what a hard worker you are, show them how smart you are, and then gain your freedom and gain other positions, or they may be a benefactor for you as you go into other lines of work or do other things. And so it could act, slavery could actually be, although not always, because anytime you own somebody, that's a bad thing, certainly. But they were, it was just a different system than what we think of as uh, American slave system as a very much a racial uh, based system. My point is, is that the Holy Spirit takes the lead. It seemed right to us in the Holy Spirit to do this. The Holy Spirit moves in Samaria. The Holy Spirit moves with Cornelius. The Holy Spirit, God through the Holy Spirit, is empowering and informing mission that is cross-cultural, cross-racial lines. And without the power of the Holy Spirit, we are only going to be going about trying to fix things, trying to make things right by our own ability, our, our own smarts, our own rationale, and what we'll end up doing is, I think, approaching it through worldly means, which is where Peter was left without the vision, and which is where Peter was left without the Holy Spirit coming upon those people and showing them that they were approved by God. It's really a shame that our churches are so racially divided. It's, it, it really, we, we, it, it's, it's not just something we should do. We are losing something by not being more diverse. And I really hope and pray that I think this, the start of, of doing this well 
is not just making a plan. How, how can we get around more people not like myself? Uh, although that is so important. I can tell you over the last few weeks, uh, the amount of people I've texted and talked to and messaged and things and, and how eye-opening that's been. It's been good for my soul. It's been sad. It's been heart-wrenching as well. We need to pray for a movement of the Holy Spirit that God would move and would show us what to do, that we would humble ourselves and submit ourselves. Because here's the deal. When we make decisions and moves and strategies, ministry, based on our own good thinking, it is not the same level of conviction than if we, through discernment, spiritual discernment processes, begin leaning into the work and the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit, to bring about unity. It is always the Spirit who brings about unity. The Holy Spirit brings about unity. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one Spirit, one God and Father of all who is over all and in all. He's in all all, how through the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit who is in believers of all races and genders. It's the same Spirit who then makes us a temple of the Lord. It doesn't just say you singular are a temple of the Lord. It says you plural are the temple of the Lord. And who is he writing to in Corinth? It's a Jewish and Gentile mixed audience who are brought together in Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 1 that part of the mystery of Christ was how in the world could God take two more different and animosity-filled groups of people than the Jews and Gentiles and bring them together in one family, perfectly united. I'm not saying we're all the same, but I'm saying in our identity in Christ, perfectly united by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, if we're going to find unity that is cross-cultural, we are going to need to rely and submit ourselves, humble ourselves, and pray to the Holy Spirit for divine intervention. If we don't do that, We will never find our way through this because the Holy Spirit always leads the way when it comes to bringing unity, and we must follow the Spirit's lead. Thank you for watching this. Thank you for listening. And my prayer is that this will open our eyes. I'm not saying I have answers. That's the whole point. I don't have answers. I know to listen. I know to love. I know to be kind and compassionate. I know to connect. But I don't have the power, and neither do you, to bring about unity, to bring about healing. We can do things that lead to healing, but if it's not empowered by the the Holy Spirit who is in us, we are missing 99% of the power that is needed to carry this through where it needs to go. So let us humble ourselves. Let us fast and pray. Let us submit ourselves to God and cry out to him and ask him to show us what to do. You know, it's, it's, it's so tempting now to lean on our, our black brothers and sisters and say, show me what to do. What do you need? Tell me what to say. Tell me what to, and, and in a sense, I get that we're saying, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. Will you help me? Will you inform me? On the other hand, it's like saying, well, let me just take the burden of the conversation and put it firmly on your shoulders to then tell me then what I'm supposed to do. Well, let's take a risk. But I think as we do that, we need to be in prayer, leaning into the Spirit, Thank you for watching. God bless you. I am so glad you're here. You are loved. You belong. Your life absolutely matters. And if I can help you in any way, if you want to text me or email me, I'll put my number up here and my email up here, and uh, and I'll put it in the description too. You are welcome to text me, call me, email, and I'll do my best to to respond to all that. And um, thank you so much. God bless you. These are are troubling times, but I'm I'm really convinced that although these are going to get more more and more difficult these times, I think that there are some really amazing, beautiful things ahead, some stories we're going to share that we would not have had otherwise. So I'm really thankful for you. Take care. God bless. And we'll see you next time.